you subscribe to my channel, you might have seen the video I made on Borden Arkson 85 as she was being brought to life here in the UK. Today I am back on board a finished Arkson 85 to show you, my subscribers, what the incredible team at Arkson have achieved since my last visit. And I cannot wait to show you around this incredible vessel. Before I do, please take a second just to give the video a like and also don't forget to subscribe to my channel. The more subscribers I get, the more boats I can get on, but I can't do that without your help. So remember to subscribe. At the end of the yacht tour, I sit down with Arkson's technical director and build captain for a chat. So make sure you don't miss that. You'll find it at the end of the yacht tour. As we trace the contours of the Arkson 85 from along the jetty, we're not just admiring its sleek lines, but delving into the heart of its structural integrity. The hull is meticulously engineered with watertight bulkheads, subdividing it into multiple compartments. The design is paramount for ensuring the vessel's resilience against flooding, whether from grounding, a very unlikely system failure, or an unforeseen collision. Each compartment is fortified with watertight doors and dual escape routes to the deck. The integrity of these compartments is further secured through carefully designed penetrations for pipework and cabling, each sealed to be watertight and, where necessary, fire resistant. The sophistication of the hull's architecture extends beneath the waterline with an integral double bottom structure, providing an additional layer of security against breaches and enhancing the vessel's structural integrity. Specialised fire protection insulation to A60 standards encases critical areas like the engine room and battery rooms, and we'll check those out in a minute. So of course on this sizeable boat deck, you can get two tenders on here. At the moment we've got one tender on the port side that can be launched and recovered using the uh, flopper stopper boom. Uh, so it also doubles up as a crane for the tender as well. But if you wanted to, you could also get a second tender on this boat. Each outrigger boom serving as multi-purpose lifting gear can pivot 90 degrees outboard. This allows for the deployment of a flopper stopper into the sea, offering passive roll stabilisation at anchor. As you can see on the deck here, we've got non-slip coating that ensures that when you are moving around on the upper deck during those gnarly navigations, then you're not going to be slipping all over the place. Uh, if you're wondering what this black box is here, I take off that cover. It's actually a foot control for the capstan, which again is a really good idea for when you're operating this boat light-handedly. And with the right experience, a competent owner could operate this boat. The two deck plates can be removed as well, so if ever you needed to haul out the engines, uh, then it's quite a straightforward process. You're not going to have to be cutting any holes uh, in the hull. You can lift them straight out of well, these two deck coverings once you've obviously unbolted them. With an L-shaped seating area out here, you can see that this well laid out and functional cockpit is also well suited for enjoying some alfresco dining. But now let us head to the bow. Moving forward along the starboard side deck, your attention is drawn to the distinctive Arxon emblem. These bronze artworks are meticulously handcrafted, creating a striking contrast between their rustic charm and the vessel's pristine finish. As you can see, really high bulwarks. When you're stowing away your lines in here, you've actually got enough space to keep them nice and tidy without them having to flake all over the deck. But yeah, you feel really, really secure as you walk along here. Nice high bulwarks with a handrail on top of the bulwarks as well. Aluminium tubular handrails encircle the bow, stern and bridge deck while removable stanchions and guard wires span the aft deck sides linking the push pit to the bulwarks. The elevated design of these bulwarks not only enhances onboard safety, but also serves a practical function for line storage. Integrated drainage allows wet lines to drip dry efficiently, ensuring they remain non-slippery and ready for use, preventing moisture accumulation and enhancing grip for subsequent handling. On the bow we find some fixed seating, the cushions have been upholstered in hard-wearing UV-resistant fabric, which is the same for all of the external seating areas. The bow anchors are handled by twin hydraulic Lumar V8 vertical stainless windlasses with vertical capstan drums for mooring line handling and independent operation. The primary anchor is a galvanised 130kg CQR type 
with 140 metres of 40 mm galvanised stud link chain. The secondary anchor is a galvanised 80 kg claw type with 110 metres of 14 mm galvanised stud link chain. These specifications are in excess of the regulatory requirements. As we spin around 180 degrees and look aft, we get a fantastic view of that beautiful superstructure. The owner of this boat also opted to have a crane over here on the port side. Before taking you inside and showing you around the accommodation areas and the engine room as well as the bridge, let's just have another look at the configuration of the bow. Remember, with a certain amount of customization, you can change the layout according to your own requirements. But now let's head aft using the port side deck. As we're walking down here now, you might wonder what this red light is up here. Uh, it's actually a warning alarm, a visual and audible alarm uh, for when you're taking on fuel. If for some reason you're taking on fuel at a port that likes to pump it on board as quickly as possible, and you're worried about having an overspill, especially in areas where you get heavily fined for any spillage, uh, then this will actually sound a visual, a red alarm, as well as an audible one as well, so you know when the tanks are getting near full. Beneath the waterline on this boat, the hull is primed and protected with intersleek, while prop speed coats the propellers and shafts. Above, the bare sanded aluminium superstructure with its visible welds offers not only a robust appearance, but also means low maintenance as well. However, if an owner wanted to, then some of the welding can be sanded flush for a more consistent finish. A variety of other optional finishes are also available, such as clear coat, painted, fed and painted, and vinyl wrapped. Which would be your option and why? Let me know in the comments. But now, let's have a look on the inside of this stunning vessel. Before we head into the saloon, it's worth pointing out you've also got a serving area over here on the port side. As we step into this area on the right, we have a staircase that leads up onto the bridge deck. And of course, we'll go and check out that area in a moment. Standard salute, Raymond, that's for you, sir, as you were. On the left hand side, we have this spacious day head that can also be used by guests and crew to have a shower. If, for example, you've come off the deck and you've been in the water. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later on in the video. Back over here on the starboard side and concealed under the steps that lead up onto the bridge deck, we have a very handy area for stowing additional gear. Thanks to the gas struts, this is very easy to open and close, even whilst holding a camera. Behind this door, we have the perfect place to stow all your wet gear, as there's a drip tray at the bottom of this storage area. So when you've come in from the upper deck with all your foul weather gear on, you can leave it in here and it will dry effortlessly. But now let's head into the open plan galley and saloon area so I can show you around this really fantastic space. Remember, if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. So over here on the starboard side, obviously we have the galley, a really nice open layout so you can interact with your guests and visitors on board whilst making your food. Over here, we have a large, fridge plenty of space in there for all of this stuff you're going to be using during the day uh, there is more refrigeration space and freezer space down in the lazarette as well here we have the four hob uh, induction cooker with another melee appliance down here all brand new stuff obviously because the boat is brand new uh, melee microwave a twin sink more storage space all of this stuff and over here we have a professional melee dishwasher that thing can actually get all your dishes and crockery clean in an eight minute cycle uh, which is really impressive in itself you can see why many boat owners go with the melee appliances you really can nice raised seating area over here the u-shaped seating area what a great place to sit down enjoy those views all throughout the saloon as well as obviously the outside as well. So there is a slight tint on the uh, saloon windows, uh, the ones that run along the port and the starboard side. You don't have a tint uh, for obvious reasons on the windows that are at the helm. But yeah, you get a really nice subtle tint uh, on these windows. These windows come with some impressive stats and we'll talk about those later on. Now large seating area over here on the starboard side. You can really see yourself laying down there, relaxing, 
chilling out. You've got a TV that retracts into the cabinetry over here. But yeah, you can sit over there whilst watching your favorite film, catching up on some TV. And also as well, you do obviously have the upper deck uh, helm position on the bridge deck. Uh, but if you wanted to, you can helm the boat from this position as well. So if your guests are down here, you know, enjoying a meal, you don't want to miss out on the on the chat, you can sit down here and navigate the boat from this position. I always have the throttle control levers over there on the starboard side. Uh, we have the rudder control lever. Everything you need to operate this boat safely can be found at this helm position. The HF radio over there on the port side. This is obviously all touch screen. So you've got all your different displays on there, exterior lights. Turn them all on and off with just a touch of a button on any of these. And navigation lights and horn menu. Engine display menu as well. Obviously both engines are not running at the moment because we're alongside. But yeah, you get a really, really good visual indication of everything that's going on thanks to that huge screen. Fuel display screen as well. So you've got the starboard and port day tanks um, over here. And then you've got the main fuel tanks which are underneath the accommodation. Um, but it's relatively straightforward to move fuel around should you need to. You can open and shut the valves as well as obviously doing it manually. Uh, you can do it automatically electronically uh, from this position as well. Fresh water menu. And then we've got the waste water. The guys that were showing me around the boat was telling me that the boat has been alongside since November. Uh, and as you can see, they haven't had to pump anything out. And they've only used just under 24 litres of uh, black water capacity. Over here, we have got the ventilation menu as well, doors and hatches. Uh, so this is a really important one for safety. So this tells you obviously which doors are open, uh, which ones are shut. So if you're navigating and you end up coming up against a storm, you can quickly have a look, find out which hatches needs to be shut. Um, this will tell you quite quickly. Obviously we've got the uh, doors there to the watertight compartments are open, these two are open, these two are open in the lazarette. Obviously these hatches are shut, so that's in green. But yeah, really nice, quick visual display of something that is very, very important when it comes to um, you know, sea safety and navigating in rough weather, which is what this boat is obviously designed to do. Then we have the, uh, the bilge display menu as well. Again, you can see each one of these lines denotes a watertight bulkhead. Um, so it, it's so heavily engineered, over-engineered on this boat. You've got far more watertight compartments than what you actually need to for the rating of this boat. Uh, but the fact they put so much effort into over-engineering that really does go to show that if you're interested in serious passage making, then this boat will fulfill your requirements when it comes to safety and when it comes to autonomous, long distance, long range cruising. Another thing that I like about the location of this helm position is that when you look up, you get a view through these two fantastic skylights. What a great place to operate the vessel from. So before I show you down into the accommodation area, which is gonna be down there, Let's go up onto the bridge deck. The over-engineering on this vessel is incredibly impressive, even on the door that leads out onto the side deck. And look, even in here in the saloon, you notice you've got a grab rail on the overhead there. So, you know, this boat is designed for when you are in those heavy seas, when you're walking around, you're not gonna be hurting yourself on any sharp edges. There's lots of things to grab onto. Up here for a start. And also look, you can even grab on to the countertop to make sure you're still steady on your feet when you're plowing through those big seas. If you want to as well, then this can actually shut. So if you want to preserve the uh, air conditioning or the heating in the saloon, you can shut that up and you're not gonna lose your cool air or your warm air. So if you've got all your foul weather gear on and you want to come in, have a shower, you can go into the, the wet head have a shower, and you can store all of your wet gear over there. But that can all be done whilst your guests 
still enjoy the peace and quiet thanks to that door. So now let's head back into the main deck entrance lobby and use the stairway to go up onto the bridge deck. By the way, if you haven't seen my new website yet, I'll leave a link in the description. Over on the port side, we have plenty of storage space and over on the starboard side, we have a seating area and a table. Back over on the port side, as you can see, we've got lots of space for storage. There's even a sink up here. So if you wanted to, you could bring up some food and prepare it here for your guests. Before I show you around the navigation bridge, let's first head out onto the deck. Over here on the starboard side, we have another seating area with a table. Note the numerous scuppers on the deck to allow excess water to drain off. Over here on the port side, we have a very handy docking station that contains the throttle control levers for the engines, as well as the control for the horn, the bow thruster, and a Furuno display. Now my subscribers probably already know this, but due to my time in the Royal Navy, I became a bit of a radar geek. So let's have a look up here and see what we've got on the radar mast. Look at that for review. If you're a radar mast geek like myself, then take in that visual spectacle. Very top of the uh, radar mast there. No, it's not a toilet brush. That has something to do with the diffusion of the static uh, electricity that gets built up on the boat. So it helps to reduce the chances of the boat being struck by lightning. But yeah, look, a full suite of Furuno nav and radar equipment up there. And obviously here as well, you get another decent view of the solar panels. As we continue our tour around the upper deck, I must talk about the glazing on this boat. The upper and lower superstructure feature extensive glazing formed of large curved bonded panels. But what is really interesting is the fact that the toughened laminated glass is manufactured to withstand the worst conditions the vessel may encounter, including full immersion. Over here on the port side of this Portuguese bridge, we have another docking station. On the outboard section of this guard rail, the owner has fitted a John Boy. When it comes to safety on board this autonomous explorer, then no expense has been spared on the safety equipment. Remember guys, if you need to update any of your sea survival or navigation or comms gear, then be sure to check out my Amazon stores. You'll find the link pinned in the comments. As you can see, there is an extensive array of solar panels on this Arxon 85. They are optional and they help to supplement the battery power to reduce the amount of generator power required whilst at anchor. The flexible solar panels are adhered to the superstructure, providing a non-slip and non-glare surface. Personally, I also think that, as well as providing an efficient contribution to the vessel's power, they also complement the styling of the vessel really nicely as well. But what do you think? Share your thoughts in the comments below. That completes our tour of the upper deck and the exterior spaces. So now let's head back inside so I can show you around. Go back into the bridge deck. Again, look, more places to grab onto something uh, when you're going through those big seas. I love the fact they set up the uh, traditional paper charts on here as well. Really nice seating area over here, U-shaped seating area. If you wanted to, if you're operating this boat as a couple, uh, then whilst one person is watch keeping, the other person can turn this area into a bunk. So you can alternate uh, whilst maintaining a presence at all times uh, on the bridge deck, uh, which is really important thing if you are thinking about acquiring a boat like this uh, and using it as an owner operator boat. It's worth pointing out that an optional tropical specification air conditioning system can be fitted to this vessel if it's gonna operate in those kind of areas. As you can see, we've got four large screens here, multi-function displays. Uh, over here, we've got all of the emergency stop buttons uh, for the port starboard generator. Uh, the fuel shutdown button uh, and the port and starboard uh, engine uh, emergency stop buttons as well as the ventilation shutdown as well. Here we've got the, uh, just call out the ship's wheel and also you've got another control there so you can make minor adjustments to uh, the angle of the rudders. Throttle control levers over here, windlass control, button for the horn, but yeah, I mean, let's sit on here and have a look at the view you get. You've got some more controls and displays up there on the brow as well. And check these out. You can open these up whilst you're underway, especially at night. You can imagine the view you'd get looking out there at Starfield Sky. 
Just got to make sure, obviously, you shut them back up again before you hit the gnarly weather. If you owned or co-owned this Arxon 85, where would you take her and why? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Over here, behind the helm position, we've got another station. Let's call it a nav station or comms station if you want to. Uh, we've got some comms gear over here. What a great place for your assistant navigator to sit down and do some route planning whilst the vessel is underway. But not only that, because of the layout up here, you have enough space so that your guests can come and feel a part of the actual operation of the boat, helping them to really feel a part of the journey rather than just merely watching it. For me personally, this is one of my favorite areas on board this Arxon 85. I also really like the colors which the owner has used. They create a very calming and serene feeling while staying true to that home from home feel. To really get a sense of what has been achieved since my last visit to Arxon, then make sure you check out the build video that I made last year. I'll leave a link for that in the video description. I'm always left in awe when it comes to boat building. All right, let's go down into the accommodation area and have a good look around here. So this is the owner's cabin. Something's worth pointing out as well as you come down the stairs, you've got some additional storage under there, which you can lift up. I'm not gonna do it, uh, not one-handed anyway, not for the moment, but yeah, you can fit some more stuff under there. But yeah, look at this, really, really nicely laid out, really nice finish, very elegant. You know, I'm not an interior designer, as I said before in my other videos, you know, I spent five years living on warships. So when I walk into accommodation like this, I'm always blown away by it. I absolutely love it. I love the LED, obviously indirect lighting under the bed there. Lots of hanging locker space over here as well. Now on the other side of that bulkhead, uh, we have the captain's cabin. But if you wanted to, on the other hull that's being built, uh, the owner has decided to have a full beam cabin. So on the other side of that bulkhead, instead of having uh, the captain's cabin, uh, there's an office. So yeah, you can really sort of make each boat your own. Arxon are incredibly flexible when it comes to understanding what your requirements are for your own general arrangement. Uh, I like the fact you've got a seating area over there so you can get up in the morning, uh, enjoy a coffee, whilst your other half is probably still asleep if you're an early riser, like I am sometimes. But yeah, look, lots more storage up here. And on the bedside there, you've got some more cabinetry Got your USB sockets as well as your traditional pin sockets there as well. But look, you can even store some stuff in there. Absolutely fantastic. So yeah, let's go into the owner's bathroom. You know, one of the things that I've noticed about this boat as I've been walking around is that the owner is incredibly safety conscious. All of the safety equipment is clearly labelled, which I think just goes to show that, you know, when you're on a boat like this, the luxury that it offers you is really nice, obviously, but something that is more important, I think, is the safety. You want your guests to feel safe on board. You know, put it this way, I've got two young children, uh, and my wife, I'd be more than happy to come on board this boat because it's little things like the details of the fact that, you know, here, for example, we've got a, a label that indicates that in there are some torches. So if the lights all go out, you've got a clear indication of where you can get some, some light to help you. Okay, let's go into the owner's bathroom. Nice big sit down shower over there. Rainhead shower. Great view as well. Yeah, lots of space in there. Really nice finish. Everything in here is just such high quality. It is worth pointing out that the water maker on this boat has the ability to pump out an impressive 300 litres of fresh water per hour. Okay, so before I show you the guest accommodation, let's go into the captain's cabin. I'm going to come back down here in a minute uh, because we're going to get access into the engine room from the captain's cabin. But check this out for a captain's cabin. Considering we're on an 85 foot boat, the amount of space afforded to the captain's cabin is really impressive and I think really gives an idea of what the owner thinks of their crew. Over here we've even got a 
AIS and digital chart display that gives all of the information that you can toggle through, uh, which displays the same information as what you would get uh, on the bridge as well. A nice decent sized bed. You know, if you are a professional captain, and let me know what you think of this space in the comments. That's the door, uh, gives us access into the engine room, which we're going in a minute. Another decent sized shower in there, and lots of hanging locker space again, more hanging locker space. And more labels indicating that in here is where you will find the, li the life jackets, torches, and a fire extinguisher as well. Individual controls for so the climate control, uh, USB C charger sockets, as well as a, another pin socket in there. Here we have the first of two watertight doors. So, if you are going to go on a transatlantic voyage, uh, then you would have this door shut as well as the other watertight door uh, forward as well. Now let's go into the guest accommodation. Over here on the port side, uh, we've got a double. It's currently configured as a double. If you wanted to, you could turn this into a twin single. You'll probably see the runners there on the deck. So yeah, you can open this uh, bed up. You would move that cabinet into the middle and you can turn this into a twin single. Again, lots of storage space, decent sized window in there, allowing plenty of natural light into the area. Lots of sockets for all of your devices on that side of the bulkhead. And over here is where we can control the climate. Not a good size shower. Very easy to maintain. There's lots of flat surfaces. So yeah, maintaining this boat, you know, is one thing that you probably know you have to do, but you don't want to spend too much time doing. I think the way this boat has been designed and layout means that, you know, you can spend less time in the mundane stuff like cleaning and more time on the really enjoyable stuff like cruising. Okay, let's go into the second guest cabin over here. So it is an asymmetrical design, but this has actually been set up as a twin single. So you can get an idea uh, of what the cabin would look like in a twin single configuration. Really great use of the light, indirect lighting, spotlights in the overhead up there. Lots of storage space. And over here is where we find the ensuite to this guest cabin. The sink there, storage underneath the sink. Shower over here, decent sized shower. Obviously got the towel rail and your toilet. Okay, let's continue forward. You probably see as well, you get really good access down into the bilge areas. Easily lift that up and look more indirect lighting. I can just imagine what it's like down here when you're underway at night with all of the indirect lighting. Look at that. Lights up as soon as you open it up. Little handheld hoover there. I'll shut that. Won't open that one. Let's go through the second watertight door. So we step up now into the forward accommodation. Now, if you wanted to, you could use this area as crew accommodation. Um, you know, as you can clearly see, there's such a high standard in all of the cabins here that. Yes, you could have crew in here if you wanted to, but also you could have your guests in here as well because all of the cabins have been finished to the same high standard. There's a prism light up there that's allowing natural light into this space. So not only have you got the light coming through from the windows, uh, but you've got a deck prism up there as well. More storage space. A really decent amount of room in here. You know, it's not like you've got the bunk above you right on top of you. You've got a nice bit of space uh, between your bunk and the one above you. Uh, so this has its own ensuite. Another window there, some blinds that you can bring down. There's the uh, ensuite shower. Obviously the sink, more cabinetry under there. And let's take you through to the final cabin. Over here on the starboard side, it's being used just to store some gear at the moment. Uh, but as you can see, you've got another ensuite 
over there. And if you wanted to get access to the upper deck through the fore peak, uh, then you can get access uh, through there. So what that effectively means is that if you did have crew on board, the crew can access the deck and their accommodation area without having to go through the main parts of the boat because you could shut that watertight door and this area could be turned into a crew only area. But yeah, let me know what you think of the accommodation. Uh, you know, share your thoughts in the comments. Let me know what you think. As you can tell, I am clearly blown away by this. It's really not what I was expecting in terms of just how lovely it looks and feels down here. But they managed to get the balance between functionality, luxury, and more importantly, safety. But yeah, let's head into the engine room. So we're going to go back into the captain's cabin. And here we have the door it goes into the impressive engine room. Before we get into the engine room, we're going to go into the battery compartment. So I know a lot of people always talk about, you know, batteries on board boats, but these are specially designed batteries just for use on boats. So the composition of these batteries are different to what you would find, for example, in your phone. Uh, they're a lot less volatile. This is all about safety. Uh, in the unlikely event, if there was a fire in here and you've got a, a door there that's obviously sealed shut, a watertight door, as well as this one. Uh, so in the unlikely event of there being a fire down here, you can shut this compartment off activate the fire suppression system and yeah the fire would be put out but look how easy everything is to access yeah when it comes to safety as well you've even got a perspex bit of glass there that protects these kind of live circuits so if you are leaning over here with a spanner trying to undo something you're not going to end up short circuiting the, uh, the electrics on board thanks to that uh, placement of that perspex glass Okay, let's go into the engine room. In we go. Now, if you love engine rooms, I am sure you are gonna love this space. Got the two generators over here. Behind me, we've got the water maker. The filters are there two chiller units so just for orientation at the moment we are looking at the starboard side of the boat and look we've got the Cabola diesel heater as well apparently once that thing is fired up the whole boat can be warmed up in literally just over five minutes so yeah really impressive bit of kit there considering the volume uh, on this boat immersion tank but yeah look comes to the beating heart of this boat the twin Scania engines uh, if you wanted to you could have Cummins engines on here as an option but yeah the owner of this boat uh, having been well versed with the operation of Scania engines on his previous boats uh, elected for Scania as an option on here but yeah check out this so here you've got the v-drive so you can see you've got the first shaft coming out of the engine goes into the gearbox with another shaft coming out of the gearbox going back down towards the propeller. So what that V-drive means is that you can move the engines further back than what you'd expect to find on a straight shaft boat. So you get a better use uh, of the space when it comes to the stern of the boat. The engine room and battery room are protected by Statex aerosol fire suppression systems, which have both heat and smoke detectors. Both compartments are also ventilated via trunks, which are fitted with 24 DC actuated fire flaps and louvered grills with water mist eliminators on their inlet. A Kohler 50 Hertz generator is installed on the vessel's centerline between the two main engines with an acoustic enclosure. If an owner wanted to, then two generators can be installed rather than one. The main machinery fuel supply is from two day tanks, both located in this engine room. The twin Scania turbocharged engines provide 400 brake horsepower at just 2,100 RPM. They've been selected by the owner for their proven reliability, commercial duty intermittent service rating and slow speed, 
which allows optimal pairing of the engine, gearbox and large diameter propellers. I could dedicate a whole episode just to the engine room. In case you're wondering what that blue light is up here on the overhead, when that starts flashing it means that one of the alarms has gone off on the helm position. So yeah, you've got your traditional red flashing light there and also a blue one as well. The boat is also fitted with a sewage treatment plant, which is one of the reasons why the black water tank levels are so low, despite the fact she's been alongside for a couple of months. It has been sized for maximum system waste output with a full complement of guests on board, and it ensures that the only discharge over board is clean water within Marpole limits. Over here on the port side, we've got a workbench, the vice, all the tools you need to do your basic kind of maintenance or repair stuff without having to go alongside. Over here on the starboard side we've got the compressor, or one of the compressors, melee appliances. The captain was telling me that these appliances come with a warranty of up to 30,000 hours of operation which is just unbelievable. The bulkheads and deckheads in the lazarette are coated with mascot thermal barrier paint with a wipe clean top coat and removable aluminium checker plate sole panels. As with most lazarettes, this area is primarily used for stowage of deck equipment, spares and water sports gear. An optional 21 kilogram aluminium fortress kedge anchor with 12 meters of 12 millimeter galvanized chain can also be stowed away in the lazarette ready for use as a stern anchor assuming that of course you have the aft mooring winches fitted. When it comes to her ride control and stabilizers, an owner can opt to have active interceptors fitted to the transom. These provide fantastic trim control capability at higher speeds. When it comes to roll stabilization, an owner can opt for Humphrey fin stabilizers and or gyro stabilizers. If you are interested in finding out more about Arxon and in particular their co-ownership program, then make sure you head to my Linktree page. I'll leave a link in the video description. Coming up in just a minute, I sit down and talk to Arxon's technical director, as well as a build captain during a 20 minute interview, during which I presented to them some of the questions submitted to me by my channel members. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, please don't forget to give the video a like, and also don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you've got access to a boat you'd like me to feature on my YouTube channel, then feel free to get in contact with me. You'll find my contact details by clicking on the link that I'll pin in the comments. I'd like to say a massive thank you to Arxon for allowing me to come on board and spend the day filming this beautiful boat. I'd also like to say a massive thank you to the owner as well for allowing me to come on. I've really, really enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about Arxon, then I'll leave a link to their website in the video description. Until next time, fair winds and following seas. Hi guys, welcome back. So I've just finished filming the sea trial footage on the Arxon 30 and I can't wait to share that footage with you. I've also spent the day on board this beautiful Arxon 85 filming some walkthrough footage and I'm going to share that with you later on as well. So at the moment I'm sat down with Ben who is the build captain here at Arxon and also Jim who is the technical director at Arxon. A couple of weeks ago, I asked you, my subscribers, if you had any questions that you'd like me to put forward. Uh, lots of questions. I've picked five, which I think will be the kind of questions that most of you want the answers to. So first and foremost, thanks for having me here today. I've really enjoyed it. No uh, absolutely you. stunning boat. I can't wait to share the footage with people. Uh, it is just incredible how far you know things have come from when my last visit was here, when I was doing the build video, which you know seems like an eternity, but it wasn't really that long ago. But to come here now today and see everything like it is, uh, it's just really, really like blown away by it. So one of the questions that I had, and I knew that we'd get questions about redundancy because obviously you know this is a really capable explorer. So a question that I had in relation to that is somebody asked, how much redundancy is built into the boat and how easy is the equipment to maintain, especially whilst underway? Yeah, so redundancy, as you've seen walking around the boat, is, is a really key part of what we do. And that's driven partially by the fact that we, we largely follow classification society sort of requirements for, for systems design, whether that be materials or, 
operation, backups, things like that. Yeah. So in general, there are that any anything that's anywhere near critical to the operation of the boat, there are two of. Most things, there are at least two of anyway. That's one of the things that really stuck out to me is the amount of redundancy on this boat, especially in the engine room. You know, you've you've done redundancy for equipment that doesn't necessarily need redundancy, but you've done it anyway because that's the kind of message that you're putting across is that you know, this boat is all about, if you're in a situation that we always want to try and avoid, but inevitably you might end up in it, you know you're in the safe hands on this boat. And I think that really kind of stands out. Yeah, I, I mean, I talk about sort of some of the critical systems, but th th this is a this is a, an explorer yacht, and people want to be able to cruise autonomously and go long distances to remote areas. And so, actually, if something were to break down, which yeah. things eventually do do fail, and uh, and um, it, it may be something that might not be critical to the operation of the boat, but maybe something that makes life on board uncomfortable or maybe maybe just an inconvenience. So yeah, absolutely. De definitely we'll double up on those things to make sure the owners can carry on enjoying them without having to have support close by. And in terms of maintenance whilst underway, you know, setting the scene, if you are on a, a like a long distance autonomous passage, how easy is it to maintain a boat like this if you're operating it as, as, a, as an owner operator, as an example? Well, yeah, I think one of the things that we probably saw as you were going around today so for an 85 foot vessel and hopefully the guys at home will see in the video too is you know the access you've got around the engine space yeah and the ability to actually easily get to things um you could have probably made that engine room a little bit smaller with the same amount of equipment but mm -hmm. you're going to be fighting over things or having to remove other pieces of equipment and that transcends as well through to the build spaces so anything that you're likely to need to access or service, it's simply a case of lifting up a sole board yeah. and you can get in there. So yeah, again, as part of the design ethos behind these boats is the ability to um, service your equipment mm -hmm. as, as simply and easily as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And no, that really comes across, um, you know, in every part of the boat, like you say, in the engine room, in, in, in the battery room, everywhere. Everything's so easy to access and, and, and easy to get to. And labelled uh, as well. I think yeah. that's something that often gets missed, um, you know, actually putting on vital pieces of equipment, what it is, what it does. Yeah, yeah. and actually uh, in, the, in the operating manual for the boat as well, and we, we, a lot of, I think you often see a generic operating manual done for a, a range model um, of, of boat, and, and in time that might become obsolete really because the design has evolved or things have been put in different areas because of different arrangements, different customer choices, whereas our operating manual is written for each boat. So we have the ARC 85 op operating and maintenance manual, Yeah. Um, and the technical author that writes that comes back on the boat and actually verifies it for this specific boat, takes photos, puts those into the manual of the actual equipment on board. So you know exactly where everything is on this exact boat. Yeah. Um, and then how to maintain it, where to find the parts. That's and how interesting, how thick would that manual be? If you, like, you know, once it's been put together, how, how big is it? It's not quite yellow pages, but it's, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's a bit of a wodge. Yeah, I could imagine. It's about as thick as the glass on the... Uh, Which is 25 mil, 25 mil, right? 25 mil, exactly. yeah, there we go. <laughs> Uh, another question that we've got is um, the difference between the conventional diesel engine option and the hybrid propulsion with electric motors. Which is more fuel efficient, uh, which is easier to maintain and service, and the long-term cost comparison? Um, so uh, there, are many, there are many benefits for the hybrid system. Um, there are also many ben benefits for the conventional. There's actually a crossover kind of if you, if you look in the, the fuel consumption figures for, for both of them at around about sort of nine and a half knots, something like that. They, mm -hmm. they, they cross over and the, the, the hybrid system is, is designed to be fuel efficient at that sort of typical cruising speed and, and below. Um, for people who are wanting to spend more time going around at higher speed, then they probably find actually the, the conventional might be ever so slightly more fuel efficient. Yeah. What the hybrid, that's in terms of propulsion, what the hybrid system gives you is, uh, is much more versatility and capacity in terms of dealing with hotel loads. So mm -hmm. for instance, on a boat of this sort of size, you, you, you're, you're your, your possible hotel loads, could, there's, an, there's an enormous range there, depending on how you operate the boat. There's no, if you're really power frugal, um, yeah. you, your, your power consumption, your fuel consumption will be, will be significantly less. But that hybrid system, larger battery banks, um, higher capacity generators, um, just gives you more flexibility in, in how you operate that, and you're always operating that at, at peak efficiency. So, yeah. so it's really not an easy apples with apples comparison. Yeah, which is uh, fair enough. It's and all I think, about the pressure on the boat. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think. It depends a lot on your use case, not just from a kind of what sort of speed you want to be operating, but the sort of areas you want to be going as well. I think there's a lot of 
people that are used to having um, vessels coming into anchorages and having maybe a, a generator running or something like that, one of the beauties of the hybrid propulsion system is you can go on a zero emissions uh, for around about a 30 nautical mile range. Which is quite impressive, 30 nautical yeah, miles. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Now, you're not going to be doing that at nine knots. You run your batteries down fairly quickly. But if you want to make your way into a cruising area at sort of five, six knots, completely silent, no motors running, no generators running, um, more importantly, no hydrocarbons disappearing out yeah. into the atmosphere and things like that as well, um, it's going to allow you to access certain areas that you perhaps wouldn't be able to access with a motor vessel um, and you know, irrespective of that from a, um, a, a passenger and, and owner um, this or guest perspective that was the word I was thinking yeah yeah from a guest perspective um, a lot quieter uh, smoother you know the generators themselves are even even when the generators are running yeah you're going to find that the hybrid propulsion system is going to be significantly quieter yeah. significantly smoother um, which is a big thing for some people yeah absolutely do you find that you get in terms of inquiries is it an even kill like 50 percent of people inquire about diesel 50 percent hybrid or is it more leaning yeah. towards hybrid now I'd say it's probably about 50-50 actually. Yeah. Um, we get a lot of a lot of people are interested in uh, um, in in the hybrid option. We get a lot of people who actually it, it's a step too far for them still. You know, they're, yeah. they're, 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 you know, they're, they're a hybrid <coughs> drivetrain. It's a there's a bit of skepticism there, but actually, when we have those conversations, those people are often quite actually quite pleasantly surprised about, about when you, when we talk about the levels of redundancy and, yeah. and that and that side of things. It's, Absolutely, um, it's not such a big step. Okay, and uh, another question from the channel member that we have here is, uh, were there any thoughts on augmenting the solar capacity in port uh, with flex panels mounted on the Bimini canvas? Yeah, is the simple answer. We, yeah. we I mean, we in, in the early days of the design, we, we looked at this in terms of, right, what, what fixed capacity of solar can we reasonably get on by the time we've accounted for skylights and the mast and other things that need to be mounted on those roof surfaces? Yeah. And, and how, how might we supplement that? And we looked at we looked at solar solar fabrics, and it does it does add to the um, to the capacity. They're they're less practical to handle. Um, you can't just roll them up quite as easily as you can with a yeah. morning. And um, so I think for someone who was who was really going to operate the boat frugally in terms of power, um, and who was really looking to to to, to push things in terms of solar, it, it's it's viable. It's something that can be done. Yeah, yeah. I can just like you say when you say it's harder to roll up. You can imagine like a squall coming in, and all of a sudden you've got to try and wrap up this solar kind of bimini. I, oh, I can imagine it'd be a nightmare. Um, so another question we had, uh, I, I knew this one would come up because it gets asked quite a lot, especially with you know really capable boats like this one. Is somebody said uh, asked about the boat's self writing ability and its limitations. Yeah, so we, we steer clear of talking about self-writing. Self-writing conjures up images of, of um, pilot boats, all-weather lifeboats, boats that are designed to be able to get rolled over in the surf and carry on with their mission. It's, it's, it's very different. You know, they're very, the design is very heavily kind of almost compromised around yeah. that ability. Um, for us, it's more about instilling confidence in people that there's an inherent... The boats are so stable, there's this inherent kind of capability in there of, uh, in terms of positive stability. So what we the, how, how we talk about it is in terms of there's 180 degrees of positive stability so mm -hmm. in any operating condition um if if you were to get knocked down or the, the worst was, was to happen the, the the boat has positive stability and it will um it will find its way back to the you know back to the right the right yeah. way up yeah we'll come um, back up yeah and and of course there's going to be damage done you know yeah. you, 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 an 85 foot boat getting knocked down you know it's it's an extremely rare thing to happen yeah but i think inherent in our design and in, in the robustness of the glass, the doors, the structure, um, is a much higher capability of, of, of dealing with that Absolutely. Than, than you might find on another boat. So that, that's, that's sort of how the words we use to talk about that. It's almost like an emotional insurance policy, isn't it? Like you, you yeah. think if you're going to be going out with your family, you know, doing the long distance stuff, you know, all the weather planning you can do, you can't always mitigate that storm coming in, but you know that if the worst happens, then the ability of this boat to look after you, if, if something yeah. does go seriously wrong in terms of the weather and the sea state, it, it's there if you need it. Well, so, you, yeah. you want to give people the confidence. You're not buying a vessel like this necessarily to, well, you may choose to buy a vessel like this to bimble around um, in sort of calm, sheltered waters, but you want to give people the confidence, perhaps whether they have experience of this or not, um, to go to the sort of places that perhaps they would be less confident to do so on mm. a more sort of traditionally designed vessel and you know broaden people's horizons and give them that opportunity to go to the 
slightly more remote and uh, perhaps don't you know if you're going to pop the boat round down and head down to Ashwire or or, or yeah. dip round the bottom bottom there and um, perhaps you maybe would choose not to do that on a certain vessel, but you can have the confidence that if something were to happen on a vessel like this, you're going to be um, far better looked after. Yeah, incredibly safe hands, yeah. And the final question, um, so someone's asked, can the vessel be operated by an owner-operator? Well, I would say that depends a little bit on, on the owner-operator, yeah, to be honest. Absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think look, there's there's nothing to say that an owner operator couldn't run one of these um, vessels themselves, and I think certainly with time you would get used to the boat systems, um, and not even so much from a from a boat handling perspective. Absolutely, mm. um, the reason generally you'd have a boat sort of of this size with at least a crew member, whether they're permanent crew or not, um, is purely for how keen that owner is to be maintaining the various systems on board. Yeah. Now, if there's a sort of owner that really likes, enjoys getting their hands dirty and running around and kind of doing generator services and changing filters and doing all that stuff that you would expect on a boat with double the number of systems that you may see on another, yeah. another set of boats, yeah. absolutely, there would be nothing to stop you. Um, generally, most people would choose to have a crew on this vessel more to help um, maintain the boat over the long term. Um, yeah. And... But yeah, if you had, say, for example, a, um, a family and you had enough people on board that were all keen to muck in and, and you know, get involved and you, you've got your daily chores and your task list and you're yeah. treating it more from a uh, let's go and enjoy this as part of the process of maintaining the vessel, 100% you can yeah. do it. I just think very often owners who are buying into this sort of size vessel quite enjoy doing the fun bits, but yeah. maybe not so much the, uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the hands dirty there, stuff. There are a lot of customers out there who, who, who own um, these sort of ex explorer style and trawler style yachts, and they are, they are enthusiasts when it comes to operating and maintaining these boats. So there are definitely people out there who, who would buy this sort of boat and mm. would, would, own, would own it and operate it, um, accepting the fact that, as, as Ben said, there's, there's upkeep to do there. Um, yeah. But, but it's, yeah, I, I, it, it's it's definitely it's definitely viable for the for the right owner. I think. Sorry, yeah, go on. Please. No, I was just going to say. I think you, you know I'm I'm aware of certain owners who perhaps operate a vessel sort of around the sort of 70, 80 foot mark, and what they enjoy is taking the boat out themselves with just them and their family or their friends on board. But what they will very often have is they'll have someone who acts as sort of a bosun engineer, who when the vessel's not in use, you know, you go and do your weeks cruising somewhere, you bring the vessel back in, tie up in the marina. That crew member, permanent crew member, moves back on board and does all the little bits and bobs and the various sort of uh, regular service items, or yeah. or helps out with the cleaning and, and yeah. that side of things. Oh, that's one of the things we were talking about earlier on, wasn't it? When we were walking around, is especially the uh, the layout on here, the, the GA on this boat. Is, you know, if you wanted to operate it as an owner operator, you can, but at the same time, if you wanted to get professional crew on board, you can have that as well because the layout and you know they can have their own section um, mm -hmm. up in the forward part of the boat. So yeah, I, I think the. the what, one of the impressions I get from Arkson is that, you know, somebody comes to you with their aspirations in terms of what they're looking for. You know, you guys aren't going to say, well, no, we can't do that. You, you, you seem very open to talking with potential buyers about, you know, how you can configure the boat according to their needs. And I think, you know, that, that yeah. says a lot. We want to sort of facilitate um, people's dreams, really. It yeah. may sound a little bit cheesy, but that, that's certainly what gets me out of bed in the morning is we're providing um, not just... You know, it's not just about being a vessel manufacturer. It's about giving people the tools to go and have those experiences that they want to have, and we'll help them at every step of the way. Not just in terms of here's your boat now, off you go, good luck. It's, yeah. You know, there's there's you, you you're buying into part of the family. Yeah. Uh, and uh, whether that be help with itinerary planning or um, you know a number of other elements as well. Arkson's there to, to ensure we're not going to sell you the product that is um, not right and fit for purpose just to see some uh, see some profit out of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, we want people to go away and, and feel that taking an Arkson on board is, um, is enhancing their experience. Of life. Yeah, no, it really comes across. I must admit, after today, I have decided that I'm going to set up a GoFundMe page. So, <laughs> viewers, members, if you want to chip into that, we'll buy one of these and we'll all take it in turns. Uh, and go out on it. But no, thanks for having me today. 
Ben's been an absolute pleasure. Ben's, yeah, always a pleasure. Jim, been an absolute yeah, pleasure. Cheers. Guys, remember, if you want to post any questions when I do these kind of tours on board and Q&A with the builders, uh, then if you're a channel member, I'll always take your questions to the builders. And when we sit down and have Q&A sessions like this, I'll put your questions forward. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to give the video a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time, fair winds and following seas. Excellent. As always, I'd like to say a massive thank you to my channel members for supporting my channel by becoming a member. If you're interested in finding out more about this, then click on my Linktree page. You'll find the link in the video description and pinned in the comments. If you're still watching, please remember to give the video a like and also don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And if you've watched it all the way through, then do me a favor, leave me an anchor emoji in the comments so I know how many of you have watched the whole episode.